Welcome to the book of Joel, chapters 1 through 3, a short book, but a very significant and important book in the latter days. All the material I took for this presentation comes out of the Institute Student Manual. Because of time and effort, I, and because of what they said was pretty comprehensive, I just took uh, information from then and now we'll just present it to you. By way of introduction, prophets of the Lord were called to labor among people whose lives remained in spiritual darkness. Joel is one of these prophets called to minister to a people who refused to repent. His prophecies have a common theme with those of Isaiah, Jonah, Amos, and others, repent or face destruction. Joel is particularly significant to us because he prophesied of our day. On the night he visited Joseph Smith, Moroni quoted from Joel and said that the prophecies would shortly be fulfilled. Joel is also a major source of information on the Battle of Armageddon, one of the momentous events in the coming history of the world. So although the book of Joel is a short work, it is full of valuable insights and information. They are applicable to us today, although they were written over 2,500 years ago. Bible scholars do not agree on when Joel lived. Some think he preceded Amos and Hosea because both men quoted him. But it is also possible that Joel quoted them, so this evidence is not conclusive. Joel may have served before the time Isaiah, for Isaiah quoted one of Joel's prophecies. But, like I just mentioned, it may be that Joel quoted Isaiah. All things considered, it seems probable that Joel's ministry took place about the time that Josiah reigned in Judah. Joel's ministry eventually came before Uzziah's reign, but after the rule of the infamous Atliah, the queen who tried to exterminate the Davidic line. The message of the book of Joel is simple and straightforward. The house of Israel has fallen into a state similar to drunkenness caused by iniquity. Therefore, great judgments will come upon them from the Lord. The judgments will be so terrible that Joel calls on the Lord's people to howl and cry for repentance. They are to call solemn assemblies and tell the people of these judgments so that they can cry for deliverance through repentance. Though the warnings are grim and terrible, Joel holds out the assurance that if the people were turned to God in sorrow and repentance, he will respond and the disasters can be averted. As is typical of Old Testament prophecies, Joel's prophecies are dualistic. They warn of an immediate and impending destruction through the conquest of Assyria and Babylonia. But they also refer directly to the last days and the destruction that will again threaten Israel just before the millennium. Or, I would actually change that wording, threaten before the millennium whether it's just before the millennium is yet to be seen. He, uh, let's, uh, let's start now in Joel chapter 1. Commenting on verses 1 through 4, the use of imagery in Hebrew literature. Hebrew literature is noted for its rich imagery. In these verses and those that follow, Joel uses the figure of a famine to portray Judah's future. The pommel worm is the Hebrew gazam, which means nar. The locust is Hebrew arbet, which means many. The canker worm is the Hebrew yelek, which means liquor. And the caterpillar is the Hebrew chazel, which means consumer. These Hebrew terms refer to the stages of development in the life of a locust. Such imagery fixed forever in the minds of the Jews and devastation prophesied by Joel for the latter days. Is the famine spoken of only literal or f and physical, or does it have a symbolic and spiritual meaning? Looking at what happened to Judah in Joel's day, many scholars feel that the pommel worm was a metaphor for the Assyrian Babylonian invasion of the Holy Land. What these two empires left, the Medes and Persians ate during their invasions. Joel 1.4 can be seen as an example of the Hebrew dualism previously mentioned. 
A prophet may refer to one incident and also mean another. For example, the canker worm could also represent the invasion and suppression of the Holy Land by the Greeks under Alexander the Great and his successors. Then the caterpillar would represent the invasion that consumed Judah when she was overrun by Rome and eventually destroyed by Titus. These references seem also to apply to the coming battle of Armageddon when the armies from the north will gather and fight before the millennium. Joel chapter 1 verses 5 through 7 comments about what is to be understood by the wine, the lion, the vine, and the fig tree. Judah had become drunken with the wine of iniquity and would have caused would have caused to weep and to howl, for the Lord would not tolerate their glorying in sin. That should be a warning to us. Our society, our world, is drunken with iniquity. And pride themselves in it and hold parades and celebrate it. God will not tolerate that in the end. And so we ought to pay attention to the warnings that Joel gives. Judah's security and wealth, which lay at the root of this wickedness, were compared to the vine from which the grapes for wine are taken. The vine was to be cut off. Judah would be humbled by the Lord's mighty hand so that they could be drunken no more. If we follow the same situation, what makes you think we will not have the same effect upon us? We're delusional to think if we're not going to have some of the same judgments. The vine and the fig tree, among the most stable and enduring plants of the plants that nourished Israel anciently, represented the finest that the Lord had given his chosen people. But they had rejected the gift and the giver, and all would be laid waste by the numberless nations, nation of invaders, who as a lion would not be denied. The lion is the most feared of animals and pulls down his prey with great savagery. A tree is barked by stripping the bark from the trunk, which kills the tree. The imagery was clear. The house of Israel would be pulled down or cut off and spoiled by powerful outside nations. Their vineyards and orchards would be desolate. Again, what makes you think we are going to escape the same results? Because we're participating in the same sins. Being spoiled by powerful outside nations doesn't mean they have to physically with an army coming and conquering us. They can do that from within. And they are today. It doesn't mean a landing force has to land and overtake America. We are being overtaken by all kinds of ideologies and governments and, and different powers and principalities. Joel chapter 1 verses 8 through 20 the loss of temple worship, Joel describes. One of the consequences of Judah's destruction and scattering as a nation was the loss of her temple worship, the source of joy and gladness, see Joel 1.16. Their field was wasted. They were no longer a fruitful people unto the Lord, verses 10 and 12. At this time, a husbandman was a person who tendered an orchard, and a vine dresser was one who cultivated a vineyard. The, the grinding in verse 13 refers to putting on clothing of sackcloth. I'm sorry, the girding. The girding in verse 13 refers to putting on clothing of sackcloth, coarse cloth made of animal hair, which would constantly remind them of the great tragedy coming to their people. Joel called upon all the people to howl and lament because the temple would fall and the people of God would undergo national disaster. Just as Moses had instructed Israel to learn a new so uh, to learn a song, the words of which would remind them of their condemnation if they broke their covenants, so Joel instructs Judah to learn the words they would cry in the last days as a reminder of her future sorrow. A solemn assembly is held to gather priesthood leaders and members to consider these sacred matters. See verse 14. The seed being rotted under the clods, verse 17, refers to the fact that when the sprout was bitten off by the locust, the seed simply rotted away. 
when Israel and Judah were devoured by their invaders, they too would spoil. The barns would be of no value, for, there would, for they would house nothing. In the latter days, our society will also be devoured. Those unrighteous wickedness will be met with judgment. Invaders will too spoil this nation. It is something that if we want to avoid, we have to cleave unto righteousness. These dire predictions were fulfilled when the covenant people fell, first to Assyria and then to Babylon, and then were ruled by the series of empires. But these verses also seem to require a latter-day fulfillment, which destruction again threatening Judah. The phrase, Day of the Lord, in verse 13, is a phrase often associated with the time just before the second coming. Chapters 2 and 3 of Joel definitely apply to the final days. We know that Israel, in the latter days, will one day again have a great army come up against it in the latter days and only be spared because of the grace of Jehovah. Joel chapter 2, verse 1, What are Zion and my holy mount? The Lord's holy mountain is the place where his temple is or the place where he speaks to the people. Sometimes it is the temple or the new Jerusalem. The Zion of the latter days also frequently refers to in scripture as my holy mount. It is a spiritual condition as well as a place. Verily thus saith the Lord, let Zion rejoice, for this is Zion, the pure in heart. So Zion is a type and a condition of people, but Zion can also mean a specific location. Speaking of Zion as a spiritual condition, Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Zion is people, Zion is the saints of God, Zion is those who have been baptized, Zion is those who have received the Holy Ghost, Zion is those who keep the commandments, Zion is the righteous, or in other words, as our revelation cites, recites, this is Zion, the pure in heart. After the Lord called his people Zion, the scripture says that Enoch built a city that was called the city of holiness even Zion. That Zion was taken up into heaven, where God received it up into his own bosom, and that from thence went forth the saying, Zion is fled. After the Lord's people were translated, for it was people who were caught up into heaven, not bricks and mortar and stone, for there are better homes already in heaven than men can build on earth. After these righteous saints went to dwell beyond the veil, others being converted and desiring righteousness looked for a city which hath foundation, whose builder and maker is God. And they too were caught up by the powers of heaven into Zion. This same Zion, which was taken up into heaven, shall return during the millennium. When the Lord brings again Zion and its inhabitants shall join with the new Jerusalem, which shall then be established. That will be a marvelous day indeed, won't it? Only the righteous will have that experience. God will have destroyed the wicked as Joel is trying to warn, if you want to be a recipient of the blessings of coming back together with the Zion from heaven, coming down and meeting with the new Jerusalem, then you must be what is called the righteous. One who follows Jesus Christ through following his prophets and does not stone nor kill them. And do not mistake that just meaning physically. There are many today who stone President Nelson with their words and actions. The prophet Joseph Smith also taught that the place of Zion, or the land of Zion, is North and South America. Though the context makes it difficult to say in which sense Joel uses the terms Zion and Holy Mountain, they are probably yet another example of Hebrew dualism. Mount Zion was one of the names of Jerusalem, and thus it is a cry for the inhabitants to awaken. But Mount Zion also has a meaning in the latter days. Joel chapter 2, verses 2 through 11. The day of the Lord is great and very terrible. The day of the Lord will be great because Zion will be a reality, but the events associated with also make it terrible, as these verses make clear. 
An event of the latter days known as the Battle of Armageddon is described in these verses, like the locusts that devour the crops and cover the heavens with blackness because of their numbers. So a great people and strong, verse 2, shall descend upon the land of Israel in the latter days. Compare this language with that of John and Ezekiel when they described the Battle of Armageddon. That's in Revelation 9 and Ezekiel 38. So great shall be the number of this people that the earth shall quake before them. Verse 10, the sun, the moon, the stars will be darkened. <clears throat> John Revelation gives the number of the army is 200 million. Uh, that's quite an army to go against the land of Israel. The horse, verse 4, symbolizes war. Chariots, verse 5, symbolize a very powerful army. Elder Joseph Finley Smith said of the warning given in these verses, quoting Elder Smith, Here we have a great, terrible army marching with unbroken ranks and crushing everything before it, finding the garden like even before them, leaving the wilderness behind, causing mourning, causing suffering. And so the prophet raises the warning voice, and that voice is to us, if you please, that we might turn unto the Lord and rend our hearts. Just as the Assyrians and the Babylonians would come and destroy Israel, then, again in the latter days, an army will come and seek to destroy what is gathered in the land of Israel in the latter days. When these events occur, they will strike fear into the hearts of Jerusalem's inhabitants. The siege against the city will be severe. The relentless army will overrun the land of Israel. The city walls will be breached and the houses plundered. See verse 9. The phrase, when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded, verse 8, may simply be a way of saying that the armaments used against the invaders will be ineffectual. But the Lord is strong and he will keep his word. He has promised to rescue his people and he will. We know from Zechariah and section 45 of the Doctrine and Covenants that the thing that will save the land of Israel in the latter days, when this mighty war comes and this devastation comes upon the Jewish people in the latter days, that Christ will descend upon the Mount of Olives, divide it into and let them skate between the division of the Mount of Olives and then destroy the wicked army. Another event yet to be seen prior to the second coming. Other events, such as the land being as the Garden of Eden before them, verse 3, refers specifically to the latter days. Today, the Galilee area and the Jezreel Valley in modern Israel have truly blossomed as the rose. Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 22, the Lord will redeem and bless his people. The Lord calls to his children in all ages, turn ye unto me with all your heart, verse 12. He desires them to become his people so that he can be their God. Elder Joseph Finley Smith commented on the Lord's powerful intervention and redemption in the latter days. You know they used to rend their garments and sit in sackcloth when they were repentant. So the Lord says, rend your heart and not your garments. Humble yourselves, prepare yourselves, O Israel, that you may receive my blessings, that you may be protected from this condition that is going to come. And then the last words that I have read from this part of this chapter, the Lord says that he will take the great army in hand, that he also has an army. His army is terrible, just as terrible as the other army, and he will take things in hand. When I say the other army, the Lord's army, do not get the idea he is talking about England or the United States. He is not. He is not thinking about an earthly army. The Lord's army is not an earthly army, but he has a terrible army. And when that army marches, it will put an end to other armies, no matter how terrible they may be. And so he says in these closing words, I have read to you, that he would do this thing. He would drive this terrible northern army into the wilderness, barren and desolate, with his face towards the East Sea and his hinder part towards the utmost sea. He would do that, and then he would bless his people, having reference, of course, to Israel. 
The figure of the bride and bridegroom, verse 16, is very apt. Israel was married to the Lord in the Abrahamic covenant. The bridegroom was Jehovah, the bride was Israel. The bridegroom returned to claim his bride who had been temporarily set aside for wickedness. Joel chapter 2, verses 23 through 27, you should know that I am the midst, I am in the midst of Israel. These verses describe Judah's and Israel's eventual deliverance. We are, what we're working on gathering Israel, brothers and sisters, is the final deliverance of the house of Israel from the world. What we're doing in the church right now is gathering Israel. And it is, we have yet to see what this is finally going to turn into, especially when we gather Israel from the four parts of the earth and the return of the lost ten tribes. Those are two different events. We have yet to see things that we can probably comprehend as this gathering. The years of the locust, the cankworm, the caterpillars, and the pillar worm indicate generations of oppression for scattered and rejected Israel. All was not lost, however, for the Lord promised the former rain and the latter rain. Verse 23. 23. After a punishing drought, these rains returned, a symbol of God's acceptance of his people who had been chastened and redeemed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. One major theme of the Old Testament prophets is that although there will be a great apostasy in Israel, in the end, Israel will be restored to the covenant, meaning the gospel, and become fruitful. We are living during the time of this restoration. This is what we're gathering Israel for. A great apostasy has happened. The time of gathering is now coming in. And we are yet to see more miraculous things. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 32. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. When Moroni appeared to the prophet Joseph Smith, he quoted these verses saying that they were not yet, I'm sorry, that they were not yet fulfilled, but soon would be. Moroni also explained that the fullness of the Gentiles was soon to come in. These statements clearly put the fulfillment of this part of Joel's prophecy after A.D. 1823. It obviously applies to the latter days as it is in its language and content, although it has been fulfilled previously. Verse 32 is a reference to Jesus Christ. Sidney B. Sperry, great Old Testament his, uh, scholar, said, added, In the mind of the writer, no doubt remains that Joel foresaw the dispensation in which we live and God's judgment up, judgments upon the world. This he expressed in figures that would be easily understood by his people. So acutely and painfully were the judgments that Joel saw impressed upon his mind that he cried out in anguish as if he were present to the people of our day to repent and escape God's wrath. The last days are to be characterized by the pouring out of the Spirit upon all flesh. Peter experiencing a rich and wonderful outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost quoted Joel, see Acts 2, 17-21, who spoke of the latter days, the time just before the Lord's second coming, when he would pour out his Spirit upon all flesh. That Spirit is not only the Holy Ghost, but also the Spirit of Christ, that Spirit which enlightens everyone. Sons and daughters will prophesy, preach, exhort, pray, and instruct so as to benefit the church. Direct revelation will be given. Young men and women who are representatives of the Lord will be inspired. The gifts of teaching and inspiration will be given to all classes and levels of people. The Lord will call and qualify those he chooses. He will pour out his spirit upon them, and they will be endowed with the gifts necessary to convert sinners and to build up the church. Certainly this prophecy is now beginning to be fulfilled. The message of this passage is fourfold. One, there will be a rich outpouring of the Spirit of the Lord in the latter days. Two, 
certain signs will be fulfilled before Christ's second coming in the clouds of heaven. Three, his coming will be great for the righteous and terrible for the wicked. And four, the remnant, verse 32, Israel of the latter days will be those who are left after the period of tribulation and scattering is over. Let's turn to chapter 3, the final chapter, verses 1 through 8. I will gather all nations. These verses add to the picture described in chapter 2. Joel used allusions and figures well understood by his people to describe the great signs and judgments to take place in the latter days just before the return of the Lord. In chapter 3, Joel gave another picture of God's judgment upon the nations. Israel, who had been scattered among the nations, will receive a change in her fortunes, and retribution will come upon her enemies in the valley of Jehoshaphat, literally meaning the valley of decision in Hebrew. Just where this valley is located is not entirely clear. Most likely, it is the Kidron, a narrow valley between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. This passage seems to refer to the final scene of the Battle of Armageddon in Jerusalem, when the great earthquake will strike the massive army and Jesus will appear on the Mount of Olives to deliver Israel, as I previously stated. These verses are a declaration of war on the Lord's part. They are also a challenge to those who would test his might. And the world is going to find out that you don't do that. The world, one day, brothers and sisters, and if you and I are not repentant, we'll be a part of this. The world will find out that God is mightier than they had ever supposed. Joseph, Elder Joseph Fielding Smith said, We find Joel, Zephaniah, Zechariah, all proclaiming that in these last days, the days when the sun shall be darkened and the moon turned to blood and the stars fall from heaven, that the nations of the earth would gather against Jerusalem. All of them speak of it. And when that time comes, the Lord is going to come out of his hiding place. The Lord will be the strength of Israel and will smite her enemies with plagues so severe that their flesh will rot and fall from their bones. Their eyes will be consumed in their sockets and their tongues in their mouths, both men and beasts. And you see Zechariah 14 for that. Also, Doctrine and Covenants 45 describes that. And when Judah will know that Christ is the Lord their God, for he will stand on the Mount of Olives, which will cleave in twain, and Judah will see him as their delivering Messiah. They will ask about his wounds and learn that he is the Christ, and the morning will know no bounds, for they will know that he is he whom they have waited and whom their fathers crucified. Joel 3, verse 17, Jerusalem be pure, strangers as used in the Old Testament, refers to Gentiles or those not of Israel. This verse states that no strange God nor impure God will be permitted to pass, to enter or pass through the city. This promise is yet to be fulfilled. Joel 3.18, a fountain shall come forth. Waters issue from the temple. The prophet Joseph Smith proclaimed Judah must return, Jerusalem must be rebuilt, and the temple and water come out from under the temple, and the waters of the Dead Sea be healed. It will take some time to rebuild the walls of the city and the temple, and all this must be done before the Son of Man makes his appearance. So this fountain shall come forth that Joseph referred to is probably the same thing referred to in Ezekiel, that a, uh, <clears throat> water must come out from under the temple and heal the Dead Sea. The waters issuing forth from under the temple in healing of the Dead Sea may occur when the Lord himself sets foot upon the Mount of Olives, causing this mountain to divide, divide into two and create a large valley. Joel 3, 18-21 The hills shall flow with milk. Upon accepting Jesus Christ as their Redeemer, the Jews will enter into a new era. The very mountains and hills will flow with the riches of heaven. This imagery implies more than just an abundance of tangible fruits. Judah will know her God, and he will know his people. They will build their Jerusalem and inhabit it in peace hereafter. Like I said, for 
Israel and Jerusalem to be at peace and to build their temple, to have their temple and to be at peace and to build their city is something to behold indeed and yet to be seen. Well, that's the book of Joel. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and please subscribe to the channel.